Hello and welcome to another episode of Grange TV. We have with us, as always, Mr. David Roberts, TAFE extraordinaire um, and sound system genius. Um, I will be going at this alone as far as the host capacity moving forward. Rob's not working with us uh, in that capacity anymore. He may come, come back on as a guest later on. He's more than welcome to. And yeah, like... Yep, so Fab with that is, um, you know, we won't have Rob for the breakdown of the, f the fight that he just had. What's your views on it? And how did you think the game plan went? Oh, man, honestly, it was one of those things. I, I didn't think I was even going to watch that fight. Like, I get, I get so nervous when any of the boys fight. Um, but I ended up watching it uh, straight away anyways. Like, man, I was very, very, very nervous. Uh, I'm never going to be objective calling or watching any of those fights, uh, any of the guys that I've trained. <clears throat> it's just... For me, it's, it's, it's very hard to just watch it objectively. Man, I, I thought Rob looked amazing, I think. But, but the thing is, man, people make a big thing about him losing or whatever. I think he's lost three fights in his whole UFC career as a welterweight and as a middleweight. I think he's lost one fight in five or six years. Um, I, I do believe he'll go down as the best middleweight of all time. That's my opinion. Um, you know, he's very young in his career and the fight itself... I thought it was very tactical, but other than the first round, I always felt like I always felt like Rob was going to win. I always felt like Rob was going to either catch him with something, or um, I, I just always felt that you know. I, th I think Till hit Rob with a, some good shots. Yeah, that but, elbow. Yeah, the elbow too is a combination. I think in the fourth round from memory, but man, Rob's got a chin, you know, and it, it, it's very hard. Like. He, anyone can get caught on any day, but you gotta, you really do have to put Rob out. You know what I mean? And uh, it's not easy. You have to really catch him. And Till's shots, I think also Rob hurt Till's leg pretty badly, the MCL, he, he, when he stomped on his knee. And that probably took a lot of the zap away from the punches. And I don't think you're going to stop Rob without full power, you know, being able to time your shots well. So being able to, the fact that Rob was able to hurt him, the fact that he was able to affect the timing, Till couldn't really get those shots off, and it's he's very very hard to get his time the timing on. Yep. One of the things I noticed, um, Rob going for the takedown, but then coming over with the overhand punch. Um, I, I've actually witnessed that. Um, he's rehearsing that. What was the ideology around that? And it was something I remember you were doing it with Izzy, but it's it worked very well for Till. I mean, I, I can't say what the – because I, I, I'm not involved in, in the training or anything, but I'm sure, like, when you add the wrinkles – like, I don't think any, I don't think people have seen, like, what Rob is capable of or what he has available to him. So um, I can't really speak on it. I don't really want to speak too much about Rob's skills or what he has because I think um, – people can go and learn that the hard way, you know, so I'm not, it's going to be, it, it'll be very hard for me to do a breakdown because I worked with him for, for so long and I'm not, you know, I think it's um, like a conflict of interest, like a- Great secrets. Yeah, no, it, more, more than that, it's like a confidentiality agreement, you know, yeah. I can't, even if, even if I'm going to say something that's complimentary to him, it's, it's stuff that he's got. Like, I'd rather people learn the hard way, you know what I mean? I'd rather they learn- who he is in there in the octagon with him and good luck you know what i mean so what do you think is next for rob well he's got canon yeah next is uh, that official I, I, again I, I don't know but i i i think that's a good fight for rob that was going to be the fight before um i i, I honestly to, to tell you the truth on a good day i don't see any middleweights beating him i don't see many light heavyweights beating him i don't see many flyweights beating him but um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. You know, like that's no disrespect to Israel Adesanya, who obviously has a win over Rob, Paulo Costa, who's no easy fight, Romero again, Cannonier, Till, Gastelum, Hermanson. Um, these guys are no jokes. You know what I mean? Anyone can beat anyone on any given day. That's that's easy. You know, so that's not to say that he they can't beat him. But I just, I just don't see. I don't see them beating him. You know what I mean. I just don't. Like if if you ask me that, but that's me. I can say that now as a as a fan, so to speak. As a coach, it's a little bit different, or someone involved in a training camp. I don't know. For me, it's a little bit different. But now I can sort of say stuff like a little bit more. I don't even. Oh, man, I'm not objective. So write it down in your comments and write down how I'm not objective and what a what a mean person I am and 
you know, unsubscribe or subscribe. I prefer if you like and subscribe though. That and then just write whatever you like on the comments. You know, write whatever you like. Um, yeah, but it's it's a little bit different. I think for me now, watching it, watching the fights and that, it's it's a little bit. Um, I, I can be a little bit more relaxed, and I can watch and give my opinion a little bit more relaxed about um, other people as well. You know, whereas before you, you you're careful with what you're going to say and whatnot and what stuff. So with that um, Brunson win on the weekend, what what was your feels for that one? I, I thought I, I like I, I thought Edmund. I think Edmund has a lot of potential. He's a big kid. He's a big guy. He's 21 years old. Um, I, I thought he could beat Brunson and he looked like he was landing some good shots early on. He's got some nice nice um, straight punches, but he was kind of looping them a little bit on, on the weekend. And where I thought Brunson might win was in the fact that Brunson is just a veteran, man, and he's very, very tough. And he's very – like as Shabazian's a big guy – but Brunson's very big, very athletic, um, very, very strong guy, very physically strong. And you cannot uh, you cannot buy experience. He has been – Brunson has been in there with Romero. He's been in there with Adesanya. He's been in there with Rob, um, you know, and Uriah Hall. You know, a whole bunch of really, really, really good fighters. Uh, Jacare twice, I think. Yeah, Jacare twice. Um, and it doesn't matter whether he's won them or lost them or whatever. He's – He's got this fight experience, you know. He's got big knockout power. Um, it's hard, you know. If you, you once those veterans get their role on and they 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 know what they're doing, like the way that they can manipulate time and space and energy is is, is pretty big, you know. It's not. It's um, you can't buy that, you know. That's that's my take. I thought I thought in in fairness, I thought Till looked good. I, I liked the way he looked, man. He looked really really good. But I feel that. Rob is very hard to work out in his timing and his awkwardness is very hard to work out. If you don't catch him and till caught him, credit to him, it's it's hard. It's 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 a kind of funny rhythm to, to work out and you need some time. Um I think someone like like Israel has the, the the you know, he's got so many fights, you know, that that he's he's got a bigger database with which to download from. That's what I was going to say with with Edmund. Edmund has he wrestled in high school and he wrestled quite well, and he uh, I can't remember the the competition, but it wasn't like an all American wrestler, like a big time wrestler like that. But he wrestled quite well, and he had five amateur boxing fights, and he may have had more, and he had may have had more kickboxing fights. But I've looked him up, and he had five amateur boxing fights, and and that is good experience, and it's a different, it's a good background to have. But I feel that Brunson, you know, being an all-American wrestler, uh, having like high high credentials, you know, maybe if he had caught Brunson when Brunson was younger, okay, cool. But having those credentials, having the experience and the ability and the fact that Edmund didn't put him away early, I think is probably a little bit um, – was a little bit hard for Edmund in, in that regard. But I think it was, he's going to use that as experience and he's, he's he looks really, really good. He looks like he has a really good future. And Brunson looked good too. So in terms of the segue to our guests, experience. <laughs> um, Man. How much does experience, like you are saying, downloading fights and adjusting? That's one thing I noticed Rob adjusted for the first round very well. Um, and so, yeah, so pretty much, yeah, what's your experience and then leading on to I, our guest? Honestly, I think, well, we, the guest today is Ray Sefu. So, I've, you know, th anything that I'm going to say is going to be eclipsed by what he's going to say of, for sure. Um, maybe if you can remember to ask him that, I think it'd be good because um, in, in as far as Rob in particular, there's two things. The first one is like that, that guy's going to fight till, till it's done. Do you know what I mean? Like he's not going to quit. There's going to be zero quit in him whatsoever. So even watching it live when I saw him get dropped, as soon as like he got dropped but, but um, Till didn't put him away, like he couldn't put him away, I honestly I wasn't that worried because I, I know he's not he's not gonna go away. Rob's not gonna quit. He's not gonna you have to catch him on the button. And then once you don't put him away and you have to deal with him and he starts to get the timing better and he starts to feel in his flow and be able to get his game off. Um and his experiences were like towards the end in the fifth round he got hit. 
um, and he got cut open. And, you know, that, that sometimes, you know, horribly things can, maybe a fight could get stopped with a cut, you know, especially if it's going in your eyes and whatnot. And you have revisionist history and I think it was up here somewhere and people go, wouldn't have been stopped. But, you know, you don't know that in the fight. You just know that you're bleeding a lot and you don't know where the cut is exactly. And so his ability to then shoot the double or the single and push Darren Till into the cage and hold him there and then take him down and but but basically finish that fight there that that's not only not only do you need the experience to be able to think to do that in the fight you've got to have the skill set to be able to do that um and just being able to think in there you it's it's crazy because the five rounds go by so quick when you're there when you're when you're coaching or when especially if you're fighting just goes so quick. So the the ability to be able to think and go, okay, this is where I'm at, or this is what I'm doing. That that's what's crazy. That that's that's where you see the big differences, and that's where you see it, like with a Brunson and Shabazian. Well, Brunson's had those fights. He went three rounds with Romero. He's been exhausted in fights, all of that. And Shabazian's all most of his round, I think, finishes were all in the first round. It, definitely in the UFC. Let's let's um get Ray Seffel on here, but like rather than talk to me about this stuff, there he is. Um, welcome to Grange um, TV, Mr. Uh, Sugar Ray Sefu. Um, thanks for having me. No, thank you. I'm going to say a couple of um, things. Tell me if I've missed, I probably have missed some of your accolades, but you're six times Muay Thai champion, world Muay Thai champion, eight times K1 right. Grand Prix finalist, uh, the president of the PFL, um, very proud father, husband. Um, you were you runner up as well for the K1 Grand Prix in 2000? Was that you? That's correct, yes. Okay, you sound like one of those annoying overachievers, Ray. <laughs> um, you, you know, the crazy thing was when I got into martial arts at a young age, um, I never knew where it was going to go, and then when I got to a point where I was, my coach at the time was Lolo Himuli, and uh, Lolo said, I think you're ready for a world title fight. Um, I was like, okay. So it w and it was then that uh, it kind of dawned on me that I, you know, I had the skills and the mentality and the attitude to kind of take it all the way, uh, let alone, um, or should I say, not knowing that I would go through. Uh, and win six world titles in six different weight classes. And um, and then, you know, the journey just continued from there. But it's been an amazing journey up to this point so far. You you started boxing, correct me if I'm wrong, you started boxing when you were five, eh? like your granddad, everyone's a, everyone were boxers in your family? That's right. My cousins, I mean, my dad was a boxer. Um, my cousins, everybody in our family, you know, knew how to box. And... Um, so at the age of five, my dad, uh, gave me my first pair of boxing gloves. And so I would spar my, uh, my brothers and cousins and everybody that was a lot older than I was, but I, I, I think, um, I was holding my own at the time. And so eventually, you know, um, I kind of fell into it without realizing that this was uh, was the path of my journey, and it was going to become a career. So very thankful. Obviously, uh, I thank the good Lord every day that I was blessed with the talent that allowed me to travel the world and um, make friends and meet so many people from all from all over the world. What What was early life? You were you were born in Auckland. We were raised in Auckland, and uh, some of my brothers uh, grew up in the uh, in the islands. And then one of my other brothers, Herman, who lives here in Alabama, grew up here in the states. I said, "That's your connection to." So, what is the connection to the United States? How did your brother end up in Alabama? Well, um, well, the funny thing is, you know, growing up American television. I mean, I think ninety five, ninety eight percent of television that we got was American television. And so somehow I was always connected to America that way. Um, that being said, when I came to visit my brother back in 93, um, it, I just fell in love with the place. I just felt like I was at home. I, 
everything about it. Like, well, you know, one of my favorite television shows back then was Chips. And um, <laughs> when, when I get picked up at the airport, and uh, I think um, from LAX, actually, and the drive home, because uh, he lived in Anaheim at the time, uh, in Orange County, and the drive home, uh, we, you know, we're on the, the freeway, and these, you know, police officers will pass us on their motorcycles and whatnot, and it, it just felt like then, of course, we were in my brother's Camaro uh, convertible, and he had the Beach Boys on, and it just everything just seemed so surreal at the time, because what I had seen on TV, I'm now seeing it in real life, you know what I mean? And so somehow I just found at home here in the U.S. How old were you in 93 when you went there? Like early uh, 20s? 20, 20, 21, I think, 22. Was your brother a fighter? Like what, what was he doing in Alabama? I mean, in, in, the, in the U.S.? In no, 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 he just, yeah, no, he, um, he just, because uh, he moved from Hawaii and um, he just fell in love with the place and obviously... He, he met, uh, you know, a lady, and uh, they ended up getting married, and he stayed. Okay, so so your your early life, you you were boxing and doing the stuff like all the time. Like, who who were you uh, at school? Say, like, if if we were in high school together, who who were you? Uh, I was just a regular kid, you know. Um, now I never allowed anybody uh, to get away with anything when it came to uh, being pushed around. Uh, but I just thought I was just a regular kid. Um, and were you already fighting? No, no, I, I was, I was training. Um, I was doing martial arts at the time, but no, I wasn't, um, I wasn't competing at the time. Yeah. When, when did you start? When did you start? Oh, fighting? actually, no, 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 no. Let me, let me back up. When I, by the time I got to the U.S., yes, I, I had my first fight when I was 18. Yes, that's right. Okay, so you kind of finished high school and you'd had your first fight. Was that a, a kickboxing right. fight or a boxing fight? Muay it, was a kick fight? Bo- it was a kickboxing fight, yeah. Okay, so you don't... And, and how many... Because when you went to K1, correct me if I'm wrong, you you debuted in K1 against Ernesto Hoost. That's correct. They um, couldn't They couldn't find anyone harder for you than to debut against. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, yeah, you know, it was just... Um, uh, it was crazy because, you know, I think I think at the time he was the uh, current K1 champion, and um, and and I think part of that too was because I had fought Andre Menard, who was uh, also another great fighter, um, and when I uh, beat Menard, um, so looking back on that, I think that's kind of like well, they said, oh well, you know. I, but then K1 does that all the time. You know, they, they really test you. They throw you against the best of the best. Um, it was kind of sad, though, because everything went wrong in my training camp for that first fight to the point where I was uh, close to pulling out. And my brother, uh, like Ronnie and, and uh, some of my other uh, teammates were like, Ray, you know, it might be a good idea just to, you know, pull out. And at the time, I thought to myself, if I if I give up on this opportunity, I might not get it again. So I'd rather go there, ten percent ready, and just go for go in that first round. If nothing happens, uh, then he's gonna have to knock me out. But at least um, I went there and gave it a go. And um, uh, obviously, the fight and Russia won the fight. The towel was thrown in, thrown in. I think in the fourth round. Because you know I was literally, literally just uh, taking punishment, but at the time, you know, for me it was um, was just getting through the fight and surviving, and every opportunity that I got that I could uh, land something, I threw it. But <laughs> obviously, you know, Ernesto is an amazing fighter and um, um, and a great champion. And so when that when the towel got thrown in. Uh, the fight was stopped, and then I get a, uh, I think I got a call the next day to meet with uh, Contra Ishii, uh, who was the founder and president of K1, and and I was offered a, a contract the very next day. And uh, he had some nice things to say, but 
you know, I, all I did was just apologize that I, you know, a lot of things went wrong, no excuses, but it was, it is what it was. And, it, and, um, and he said, you know, one of the things that he really enjoyed was the fact that I wasn't going to quit. And I said, you know, uh, that's, that's never been me. And, um, and I would die in there. And so, um, uh, yeah. And so my, my career in K1 started from there on in. One of the things we were just talking about off kind of off camera then, oh, we, we were on camera, but you weren't on, was just like the fight experience that you have. Um, uh, Dave was talking about uh, uh, Robert Whittaker's fight versus Darren Till. I don't know if you saw it. Um, yep, yep. Watch and, that. And then yesterday's fight, uh, Edmund Tavayan versus Derek Brunson. And kind of drawing, par- right. kind of drawing some parallels, and you know, you, you, because I know, I know, Brad has fought Rob, and Brad has fought. That's right. Um, and I was rooting for Rob, uh, you know, when he of fought course, Till. Yeah. I mean, Till is a great fighter too, but I was, I was hoping that, you know, Rob would win there. Yeah, like I think, which, which he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and one of the things that we were just talking about was the fight experience, because uh, h- how do you? You, know, you asked a question, Dave, because you, you had the question. He had a good question, and I kind of answered it, but I said, let's wait for Ray to, to answer this question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not on camera, Ray, but um, yeah, just to, yeah, it was just around um, the, the balance between sort of fight experience and downloading your knowledge of other fights to use in your current fight. Like, how much does experience plays a role in, you know, pretty much you winning fights? And I'll, I'll add a second part to that question. How much does the bad experiences, like... A, a bad preparation or whatnot, even though it's a bad experience at that point, how much does that become right. valuable five years later on, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, experience does help a lot. Um, because uh, as young fighters, there, there are certain things that they haven't experienced yet. Um, like having a sore leg or maybe hurting a rib or, or, or hurting your hand or whatever. And when you're an experienced fighter, you know how to maneuver through the fight with those injuries. Uh, so experience does help a lot. Um, it also allows you to uh, stay focused within yourself and within your mind because sometimes your mind can play up, play games on you. You know what I mean? And so with all that, with the experience, it allows you to kind of figure th- things out as the fight's happening or when you're sitting in that corner. Um, and then also allows you to be true with yourself, if you're cut out for it or not. You know what I mean? And so, and then, you know, to, to the second part of the question, yeah, um, absolutely. There are things that happens. And for example, and I'll use the fight with Inertia the first time it happened. Um, looking back on it, maybe I shouldn't have fought that fight. But because I was... I didn't want to give up that opportunity and knowing that going into that fight, if I didn't stop and in the first round that he was going to beat, you know, beat me for sure. So when looking back on it, I'm glad that I was able to kind of just bite down on my mouth guard and within myself and, and just went ahead with it because maybe I would have never gotten that opportunity ever again. Um, and because I still went through it, uh, through the tough times of it all, uh, through, you know, uh, injuries and whatnot. Um, in the end, I was able to uh, be signed to K1 and then ended up uh, becoming one of the top eight guys for a very long time for K1. So Eight times, eight times. Um, yeah, eight times. Say again? You were eight times in the right, top right. eight. Yeah. Which is and incredible. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. So looking back on it, you know, you, sometimes you make decisions and um, um, they're the right decisions to make at the time. Uh, and so when you look back on experience like experiences like that, uh, absolutely, for, on, in my case, uh, it definitely was uh, something that I needed to do. Um, speaking of K1, you were, so uh, I remember watching uh, when uh, Mike Chavello was um, commentating K1. Right. Um, I don't know. Was the you know the Pride Lady? Was she in K one as well? The, the, do you know who I'm talking uh, about? No, the Pride Lady, the, the one that did the yes. announcements. That was only in yes. in Pride. She wasn't with K one. 
Did you have yeah, someone she, like she, that? Yeah, no, no. She only announced the Pride shows. And um, but I remember watching. Watch, what was K One like? Because that was that was huge at one stage. Um, when you're in the Tokyo Dome uh, in front of seventy to eighty thousand people live, uh, with you know over six million people watching um, from all over the world, it's just um, it was it, it was an amazing experience. Um, but I gotta say, my first time in the Tokyo Dome was nerve wracking, if you will, um, because. Now you're, you know, you're up against um, the best of the best and uh, you're in this crazy massive arena that um, you can only dream of fighting in. Um, and yet, um, I mean, I remember fighting in China for my first world title uh, and I think that was in front of 30 to 40,000 people. And so uh, to think about being in front of 70, 80,000 people was, uh, was pretty... Um, Special, but at the same time, you know, it had a lot of pressures to it as well. How how did you deal with that? Like, how how did you deal with blocking that kind of stuff out? Oh, you know, once I was in the arena and we were going through the rehearsals, I, you know, which was kind of good because it allowed us to, or it allowed me to kind of uh, answer questions, what was going on and, and visualizing uh, because that's, you know, a big part of the game. And visualizing the amount of people that was going to be in there, um, and just knowing how to you know, set the tempo in terms of controlling your nerves and your, your thoughts, and and uh, just be more in tune with yourself. And so, by the time I had uh, we had done this, the opening ceremony, and we were brought out, I think it was like the second level. And when I looked up, literally, I was looking up like this, and there was people you know, straight up. And that's when I really realized how massive this arena was. And, um, and yeah, again, like I said, I, I think I just kind of took it all in and, and just try and stay within uh, myself um, and controlling my mind um, to kind of accept everything that was happening around me. Is that something you could always do? To flow. Is that something you could always do? Like, is that you, like, is that something that just happened race effort could always do like just control your emotions, control your mind and be in your head, so to speak. Or yeah. Not being um, I, but you know, all the, yeah, I, I, that was something that I always done, but at the same time, um, actually one of my best friends, Neil Walker, uh, who would travel with me, he was the first to actually teach me how to visualize, um, about, the game about the fight, when it's gonna, what's gonna happen, uh, that my raise, my hand would be raised at the end, and so on. And so, um, ever since then, I was, uh, I was able to kind of like just take all the everything that was going on around me and kind of put it in perspective of how I would deal with and and what comes next, and so on. Did you did you break your leg against Sefu in one of the fights? Because in, in against who? Oh, no, Sefu. Okay, your Sefu. Against, uh, Ernesto, Hust, against right? Hust, yeah. Yeah. So what happened was it was, it was an old injury. And it was, it was my fight against, um, who is now a, a good friend of mine, uh, Peta. And he's a southpaw. And so I tested his inside leg uh, because he's the opposite stance to me. Yeah. So I touched his inside leg and he didn't check. So I threw a couple of combinations, I, and then I really drove the kick home, and he checked. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I ended up connecting right at the joint of my ankle uh, oh. on his shin, and it tore all the ligaments in my foot. And ever since then, it's never been the same. So, you know, uh, when the Grand Prix came along, um, and I taped in my ankle, and after the fight, because I fought in, uh, Peter Ertz. So, sorry, that was against and, Ertz when you when that 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 kick that you're just talking about now. That was against Ertz when you kicked and you broke. No, no, it was, no, no, it was against uh, Peta. Ah, okay, okay, it okay. Was, okay. Uh, I I forget Peta's last name now, but um, or the pronunciation of his last name. But yeah, anyway, yeah. it was against uh, Peta, and and then the and, and then this Grand Prix, I had met Ertz in the first round in the quarterfinals. 
And, and this, is this with a uh, dislocated ankle? Correct. Okay. And heard it again. And so I heard it again against Peter. Uh, even though I won the fight, I still, uh, you know, it's funny though because there's a vi there's a footage of my team, Ronnie and the boys pushing me up the stairs because I couldn't put any weight on my foot. And you went and, to, and you still went to fight Peter Ertz. No, I beat Peter in that fight. But this was after Peter's fight. Oh, man. Um, and I was going coming out again, you know, 40 minutes later to face Ernesto Hoos. The crazy thing is, it was supposed to be Bob Sack. And Bob, um, and Bob ended up, uh, I found out later that, you know, uh, he pulled a, a fast one and because he didn't want to fight me. So, um, and so Ernesto was able to come out and say, because I, I think uh, Ernesto Pete, I bought Pete Ernesto in that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Right. And so, um, but anyway, you know, I was um, facing Ernesto again. And again, um, so the game plan in my head, and the boys were like, okay, you're not going to kick. You're just going to check um, and box. And of course, you know, when you're fighting someone like Ernesto, you can't be just, you can't just have limited tools. You know what I mean? Um, and so, of course, when I went in there, I threw a combination. I threw a low kick. Um, and of course, and, and my whole leg went numb. Um, I couldn't even stand on it. Uh, and then Ernesto went on to, I think he went on to fight Jerome LeBanner. And, and Ernesto won the Grand Prix that year. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, uh, these, so I didn't actually break it. I torn all the ligaments in, in my ankle. Yeah. I wouldn't have gone to work that day with, with that injury. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> let, let alone fight any of those guys. But, um, and, and, you cause know, sorry, sorry. It, go it's on. true. It's true when they, it's true when they say that fighters are crazy because like, even when I think back on it, I'm like, well, how did you do that? You know what I mean? And, uh, but that's. That's the kind of mentality you got to have as a fighter. Well, I was going to To, to ask become... You. No, no, please. No, no, so, you know, to, to, to climb the ladder and become uh, known as one of the, the, the best in, uh, fighters in the world or compete with the best fighters in the world, you got to have that mentality. And, um, and that's the kind of mentality that I knew I had. I knew Ernesto had. I knew Peter Edge, Sean Labana, Mike Bernardo, um, Sam Greco. You know, and so on. And, um, uh, you know, and Sam, who's also a good friend. Uh, but, yeah, that's the kind of mentality you got to have to compete with the best of the best. Can you speak to that mentality a little bit? Like, where, ha, when did you know that, okay, I'm a little bit different to other people and whatnot? Like, when did you know that? Or, or did you, is it just something that you sort of found out as you went along? And how did you, how did you exercise that? How did you tap into that even more so? It's, um, it, it comes with, um, I, I mean, like, I, I think I realized, um, realized it real early in, in my career, um, when you get pushed, uh, to the limits and you got to make that decision whether you're, whether you're willing to step out again, you know? And, um, and so, and I think to this day, um, all the fights I've had have been tough fights, you know, but the one fight that I thought I was literally going to die in there is when I fought for the New Zealand national amateur title. Really? And I, yeah. And I think that fight in itself, uh, at a very young age, uh, career, uh, taught me because it was a five round fight. And by the third round, I was, you know, breathing heavy. Um, and up to that point, I pretty much had stopped most of my opponents. So now I was in different, you know, territories that I never experienced before. And so by the ending of the third round, fourth round started, and I was really, like, gasping for air. Uh, but, of course, I had to keep this all controlled within here. And um, 
the fight went on, uh, went to a decision. I won the title. And I remember saying to Ronnie, when we're standing in the middle of the ring for the referee to call, uh, and the announcer to announce a decision, I said to Ronnie, you know, uh, hold on to me or let me hold on to you because I literally was going to pass out. And I keep telling myself, don't pass out, don't pass out, stay on your feet, stay on your feet. And so when they called the decision I won, I kind of just put on this fake smile. Um, we got out of there. Ronnie helped me out. They took me to the changing rooms. And they, I said, take me into the showers. Uh, they took me into the showers, turned the tap on, and I literally passed out in the shower. <laughs> From what? Just exhaustion? <laughs> or just exhaustion or, or, or the yeah, whole thing? Yeah, no, exhaustion and... Um, uh, and yeah, I, I think it was just from just, and again, you know, um, there was never a time in my mind that I would quit, but I, there was a lot of times in that fight, in that last two rounds, that I knew I had to keep biting down on my mouth guard and keep keep moving forward. And whatever the outcome uh, was going to be, that was going to be the outcome. But um, as long as I was moving forward and pressing the action, um, you know, I was going to be okay. And so, yeah, you know, and uh, so I was pushed to the limits in that fight. So at a young fight, um, at, a, at my first uh, natural amateur title, that fight in itself taught me a lot of about myself. And I had to do a lot of uh, soul searching and a lot of um, fighting those demons that uh, wouldn't allow me to carry on. You know what I mean? And so um, that fight has helped prepare me for everything else. So every time I, I would hit a brick wall, I knew I would have to find a way to get over that wall. Whether I was going through it, over it, or to the side, it didn't matter. I was going to find one, find a way to get over it. What, one of the, the fights in general that I don't, I, like, I, like I show people sometimes and I say, like, you know, if you – if you want to fight, have a look at this because you might run into these people one day. Um, and also the thing that that um, made me want to do anything other than fighting was uh, your fight with Mark Hunt. And I knew Mark. Right. I, I, I used to train with him back in the day. But um, right. I, I know Mark like still now, you know, like, we, like he, you know, I was going for him. Sorry. But um, right. Like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. Be because because I know him, you know what I mean? But um, right, right. Can you talk about that fight? Because that, that, that fight's insane, man. That was that was like one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, Mark and I didn't really know each other other than just, hey, how you doing? Hope you're well. That kind of thing. And also... Uh, I also had experience cornering my brother against Mark, um, and uh, and Ronnie had lost. I think they fought. I want to say twice, maybe three times. I'm not sure. And I know that Mark won one and Ronnie won one. Um, but I also knew that uh, fighting Mark was going to be, you know, was going to be a battle. The fun thing is, we when the when that match was done, we figured that, you know what, I'm, we're going to, um, we knew, I, th I think Mark outweighed me by 50 pounds. So we knew he was going to be a little bit heavier in the clinch. And um, so we were going to like basically stick and move and make him miss and make him pay. But when Mark came out like a, a bull, um, as he always does, um, for some reason, and my head was like, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to, you know. So it, the whole game plan went out the door, and I kind of re rewrote the game plan within my head at the time, and that was to bang it out with Mark. And, um, you know, but it's crazy, though, even though, I mean, anywhere I go around the world, that's the fight that everybody brings up. But I felt like, you know, <clears throat> Mark and I really bonded in the, because of that fight. Uh, ever since after that fight, I've always had a lot of respect and, uh, for him. And, and I, I've always, like, just um, supported him through his career. 
because, you know, again, when you're in there like that, uh, I took a piece of him and he took a piece of me. And, and I think um, that kind of bond just kind of bond you for life. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, yeah, it was just crazy. Uh, we, that wasn't the game plan, but it ended up being the fight that was, uh, that happened. What, what made you um, put your hands down and him put his hands down and do that? Like, what, you know, cause uh, the little boxing that I've done, they would say never ever drop your hands against someone like that. Either right. one of yours. I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, it, it, I I don't know. I think at that time, um, I think Mark just uh, it was just pride on both sides, you know. Um, I think it was just so much pride on both sides that okay, well, I'm I'm willing to take your best, and he was willing to take mine, and um, but um, yeah, I it, it's hard to kind of explain things like things like that because like you say in training that's never a smart thing to do you know um and i don't recommend for anybody to do that um <laughs> that being said <laughs> um you know uh, it happened the way it happened and um did, did you I'm, give him I'm a kiss right that did you give him a, you gave him a kiss in the fight eh? You kissed him on the cheek. <laughs> you did, yeah. eh? What, um, what, what, what possessed because, you to do you that? Know, well, because we, I think, I, I think because we banged it out and it was, um, I, I don't know, I think it was just to, to say, you know what, we're doing this and I'm going to take your best and, um, you, you know, you better be willing to take mine. And, uh, and it was, yeah, it was more kind of a um, respect kind of thing. You know what I mean? And it just, and also was like, oh, okay, um, this is how this is gonna go. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, you know, there are things that uh, that happens in there that sometimes you you just go, okay, what happened there? And why why did that? Yeah, happen? yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> that, that that was that was one of the crazy. That, that was probably K one wise. I don't know. I can't think of too many other K one fights. Well, I was just showing one of my friends. He Blake he, is he now? He and um, like. I said to him, like, this is this. Look, watch this fight. You know what I mean. And same thing for him. He never, he's never ever going to kickbox again. You, you guys probably the ratings for golf just went up. You know what I mean. People just enrolled their kids in golf <laughs> right. after they saw that fight. Um, but now you, you're, yeah, you're, I, I think the last time I, I looked, I think it's had over ten million views and on YouTube. I think yeah, something crazy. Like if yeah. any chance yeah. anyone gets, watch Ray Seffer versus Mark Hunt, and it's it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And the whole fight, like it wasn't just that though. It was like the whole fight was actually good, was a good fight. Like it was like right. technical and, and and tactical in its own way. You know, it wasn't just right. Yeah, it was. I, I thought I yeah. think it was fantastic. And here's another thing that I was going to ask you. You have very good footwork. You're very light on your feet. Is that something that's always been the case for you? Uh, yeah. I've always been, um, you know, I've always been really thankful that I was um, blessed with not only, uh, you know, again, you know, we worked on everything, like in terms of footwork. Like Sugar Ray Leonard is one of my favorite boxers. And for so many reasons. I mean, Sugar Ray Leonard was not only a boxer, but he could fight. Yeah, yeah. Not only he was classy, but he was smooth, you know? Um, he was always a very intelligent fighter. Um, but, um, and that's what I loved about him, was that uh, there, was just some, there was just an aura about him in terms of the way he went about fighting, and his intelligence in, in, the, in the ring was amazing. Um, so I kind of just, you know, uh, watch different fighters and, and pick up different things and, uh, do a few things here and there that they did or learn a few things. Um, Vanda Holyfield is another one of my uh, he favorite heavyweights, uh, just because again, he, he was a guy that came from light heavyweight and everybody, even when he was in heavyweight, uh, heavyweight, everybody, or every time I would hear the the commentators, oh, you know, we don't know if he has punching power, but yet 
he won his first heavyweight title by knocking Buster Douglas out, who knocked out Mike Tyson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then years later, I meet Evander, and <laughs> I, you know, I had asked him that why, you know, why was there all there was a hesitant or or um, uh, a doubt in these people's minds when he was continually beating fighters and stopping them uh, as a heavyweight. Um, but he, he, he couldn't understand that either. <laughs> did you play rugby or anything growing up as well? I did, yeah. Did I you did. play at a decent um, level? Like, were you, were you, were you a fast uh, runner? I was a, I, I played for a, a club team uh, under 21s for Ponsonby. Um, and I played a winger and uh, center. Because I was, yeah, I was always a, a quick sprinter. I hated cross country running, but Mate, I was you, a sprinter. You don't look like you're built for marathons, but but so, <laughs> so you were you yeah so so you were fast because because you can see it with the way you move. You know what I mean with the way you you, you used to right. move in the in the in. So so and and the thing is, like, I don't know who I was saying to you. Like you're you're like a like 120 kilo dude. Like you're right. You're, you're um, a big guy. Right now I'm uh, 280 pounds. Yeah. So what, what's that in? That's what, like that's more like it's like about one twenty five. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. one hundred twenty five kilograms. Yeah, that, that's right. a that's a big human being. But you you like the way <laughs> you were moving in that. Well, you could you could see it. Um, what was your transition like to coaching? Um, it was was pretty easy, be, you know, because um, one day, you know, uh, all my guys. So so for example, um, when I had my own team. I would be the head coach, and then when I fought, they were the head coach. You know what I mean? Um, uh, for example, I had um, Doug Vini, uh, my brother, um, Fai from Amoy, and a couple of other teammates of ours uh, from Brazil, Glauber Feitosa and uh, Francisco Filho, uh, and Babu, of course. Um, and so we had a, a nice, small team. And so when, when I fought, they were the coaches, and when they fought, I was the coach. Um, what was your time like with Lolo? We had a great time. Um, learned a lot. Lolo is a great coach. Um, but there's a time that comes, I mean, especially when I moved over to the States and um, I, I just knew it was time to move on when they came to. But we were together for, uh, I want to say, eight years. Um, yeah, he, Lolo is very... Um, uh, not only a humble man, but also a very um, knowledgeable coach. You know, he, yeah, he, he would study fights or fighters, um, whether it be boxing, kickboxing, and um, and you know, then he would learn these things, and uh, we would run through it, and and we we kind of kept what worked and threw away what didn't. Um, but yeah, he was an amazing coach. How did you end up at uh, Extreme Couture's? <laughs> so a friend of mine, uh, Jay Heron, okay, um, yeah. when he, I think, I, I ran into Jay somewhere um, here in Vegas, and he's like, hey, brother, you know, uh, Randy's opening up, you know, we just opened up a gym, blah, 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 and he said, you should come down. You know, and at this point, at this point i think a lot of our camps was in was in japan and so i'm like yeah yeah no definitely and then uh another friend of mine uh jan norke from south africa uh was living at living with me at the time well we walked into um into a sushi place spot around here around the corner from the house and um randy was in there and so you know, we said hi, and, and we got talking, and and uh, told us where to go. And ever since then, and that was probably what twelve years ago, um, or thirteen years ago since the gym opened. Um, what uh, what what guys are you have you got at the moment? Uh, young guys coming through the UFC or the PFL or anything? We're going to get to the PFL in a sec, but like, what what which guys have you got there that that you're looking after? Oh, right now I have Brad Tavares, um, Misha Strykonov, and 
a uh, couple of uh, young Russian Russian fighters uh, who are getting ready to fight in uh, end of this month and early next month. Okay, um, I've, I've gone to Extreme Couture's a few times. Uh, at the time, um, uh, Robert Follis was coaching there. Um, and, right, right. And uh, I always, always, I always liked the like w- the stuff that I saw of him, and I'd say hello to him and that in, when when I'd see him in at fights and whatnot. And um, I remember like like I wasn't like close with him or anything, but I remember where, like it right. kind of hit me when I heard about his death. Um, uh, you know, it actually genuinely saddened me. You know, like because uh, right. he yeah. seemed like a a good coach and a and a good guy. And I, I know that it's um I don't know. I just wonder, like, can you speak to that a little bit, like about your your relationship or anything with him? Yeah, no, uh, coaches. Uh, sorry, uh, Fares was one of our coaches at the gym, and um. He worked with the likes of, you know, uh, Misha Tate and a few others. And um, he's a good coach. But I didn't I didn't know him that well. Um, and so what happened was, you know, obviously very sad. But I, I'm, you know, again, I'm very close to that kind of scenario because I lost my brother when I was five years old. And I think he was 17. Um to suicide, and so I, I'm, I mean, I remember how he took his life. I was like sitting a few feet away from him, and I remember to this day exactly what happened and how it happened. Um, so, and I've never shared that story with anybody. I'm sorry and, to hear that, Ray. Again, like we spoke off camera, and I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. And so you know, I, um, as you know, as sad as it was. Um, I don't know why these things happen and, you know, and if anybody that's feeling lonely or feeling um, that they can't carry on, talk to somebody because um, that's all they can take is by just getting love and support and, and you know, um, and feeling that you're, you're worth it. Of course, we all are. You know, you know, you know what I mean, and so um, don't feel like you're alone. Were you, were you very close with your brother, the, the brother that passed away? Um, again, I was five years old, but yeah, I mean, I, I felt like you know, um, I guess just like any little brother looking up to an older brother, um, you know, he was uh, was pretty amazing, I think. If he was um, alive through me growing up, I think he probably would have been the first fighter in the family. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, outside of my, you know, um, outside of my cousins and you know, my dad. He he was the second oldest. That's correct. Yeah, um, and then you know, um, talking to my parents about him after he had passed um and obviously when i was a little bit older he was um a, he was a really uh he was a tough kid but he was an outgoing kid and um and he loved life you know what i mean and so um i don't know exactly what happened uh, again like i was only 5 years old but um and it's kind of sad because the true uh memory that i have of him or should I say the, the the memory that I have of him when <clears throat> um, remembering him is me sitting in front of him before he passed. Wow. That's, I'm sorry to hear that, man. I'm sorry to, to, to bring, bring it up. Um, and so, so right now you're, you you were telling us before that you you have a big family and Ronnie is actually your twin. <laughs> no, uh, my twin passed uh, uh, a year and oh, I misunderstood. I, I thought that when, Ronnie was your twin. Yeah, yeah. No, no, my twin passed when he was a year and a half to two years old, I believe. Okay, okay. Yeah. And yeah. what was the story you were telling us about the the passport? 
off camera. Oh, it was a whole, yeah, it's a whole mix up. I don't know what happened there, but um, they, it, it, it made out like Ronnie and I were twins. Ah, because I thought that's what I understood. Left. I thought you yeah. and Ronnie were twins, but I always thought that he was, he's younger than yeah, you. Yeah, and then, and then, the, so I don't know how that was modeled up. And yeah, but it's, it's a long story. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, I didn't know that. What's what's happening next for Brad for Brad Tavares? So Brad has um, has had an injury for a long time now, um, and he had surgery. I want to say three months ago now, or maybe four months. And so he's still in rehab and recovering. Okay. Um, I don't see Brad fighting again until probably next year. Um, but yeah, you know. Um, he's just got to go through the rehab and making sure that he's healthy and and fit to go. Okay, and uh, how how old is he now? He's like thirty, thirty one, something like that. I think, uh, yeah, I want to say he's thirty two. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I'm around, around, around there. He he started off. Were you with him from the very very start when he started in the UFC? No, um, I think Bradman and I have been, been training together now for maybe, I want to say nine years. Because I've followed um, his career. He's, he's but fought no, everyone. I think, like he's, I was saying, like, I've followed his career. He's fought everyone as well. Like, he's, right. he's always puts his hand up and fights and fights hard. Always. Right, right. You know, you know, Brad is a super talented fighter. Um, and, you know, and I don't want to make any excuses. And Brad would be the, you know, would be the last one to make excuses for anything. But that fight when he fought Adesanya, um, and of course, Adesanya is a, you know, he's a yeah, beast. Yeah, he's what he is. Um, and, a, and, and a great fighter. Um, but it was a fight that we weren't too sure because Brad had actually um, hurt his, broken his foot. Um leading up to that fight. And there was a point where we weren't sure whether that was going to happen or not. And of course, Brad being uh, tough as he is, um, just bit down and, and fought the fight. And I got to tell you, you know, and the, that fight really showed me who Brad Tavares is as a fighter. Um, and he's a true warrior. And after that fight, although we lost, but man, I couldn't be more proud of him in that fight because you know he he um, he went through and fought through injuries and 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 continued to fight and and the heart of a warrior that he is, um, he battled right to the bitter end. Yeah, and he and wasn't so, fighting a nobody either. You know what I mean. Right, he's, he's fighting right. a good fight. He's fighting the champion right now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, I I couldn't be more proud of Brad um, because you know you you I'd always known Brad was you know uh, a fighter and and a tough fighter at that, but you don't really know how really tough he he is or or anybody is until they go through those. Um, tough battles, you know? And, um, and so no, I couldn't be more proud of Brad. I, he was just, uh, truly amazing. He's a great guy. Um, he's a good family man. And, um, you know, uh, look, I think the time off and the experiences that he's had, I think the world's yet to see the best of him. I, I think with someone like Brad as well, like, um, sometimes life, life is just how it is. Cause I've, 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 I've always followed his career and, um, you always like is it just sometimes like he'll, he'll get right to the brink and then the fight won't go right. his way or you know which yeah. and and like you you know people sometimes they go why did he lose and i think like dude he, he lost because he's fighting another animal that's that's right. uh, that wants it and that day wasn't his you know what i mean like yeah and and it's sometimes it's there's no more than that like a fight's a fight one of you's gonna I'm, lose exactly uh, and, and yeah, you're absolutely right. There is no more than that because um, everything can go right, and then you get in there and 
uh, the outcome is not what you want, and you go, what happened? You know what I mean? Like, it's there's never um, the one thing about the fight game is there's no guarantees, no. you know. Um, and again, it, some days are yours, and some days is not, and um, that's just part of the game. And again, it goes back to this mindset of uh, of a um, a warrior and how much you want it and how you come back and so on. Because, you know, like, uh, I think it's great. You know, you get to watch all the, like, breakdowns and this is how you do this and this is what he could have done and this and that. And I think right. it's great for people that aren't involved and they can watch it, but I think it's also bad as well because people will ask him, they go, could, could he have moved like this? And I think, like, dude, do you understand what's happening? Like, any of those shots, like, say when you fought Mark, yeah. If any of those shots had landed a little bit different, like flush on the chin, maybe it, you wouldn't yeah. have had that amazing. You would have knocked him out, or he would have knocked you out, and it, it doesn't right. mean you're not capable of putting on that show. And I, I just right. see like I've seen Brad like just a few fights, you know what, what I mean, where it just didn't go that way, or he got caught yeah. or whatever. And I don't think people have seen the best of him either. I think that that he's got actually. Yeah. I want to get him on the podcast, Ray. If um if you could yeah, bend no, his I, arm, I definitely, yeah, I'll, I'll hook it up for sure. He would love that. No, I, we'd love to have him, man. We've, we've you know followed him for a long, long time. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your transition into business and the PFL? And got, I've got a few questions about the PFL, but can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um. Once, once K one filed bankruptcy and owing me a lot of money, um, I knew the end of my career as a fighter was was coming to close to an end. And so I wanted to um, start something and, and I had always wanted uh, and I wanted to stay in the game and, you know, whatever that meant. Um, and so when I talked to a, um, a friend of mine um, about my ideas of putting, you know, this, uh, and I was telling him about how K1 is, I'm sorry, how PFL is formatted right now as a league. And, and it was more kind of just taking the idea of uh, K1 uh, days and what I had experienced and um, putting it into this uh, American way of sports. And um, Carlos Silva, uh, was also um, our CEO at the time, and you know he made it. Um, uh, he and you know a few others um, uh, and myself kind of really put it together, and um, uh, that was the birth of PFL. Um, What's the format? So that, you you fight. So the way the yeah. So the way the format works is that uh, you got to fight two regular season fights. And then those two regular season fights, that allows you to earn points to qualify for the playoffs. So um, if you lose, you don't get any points. If you win, depending on what round you uh, you win at, whether it's first, second, or third. Um, so a win is three points, and a um, first round finish is three points. Or if you're a second round finish is second uh, is two points, and a third round finish is one point. So you can earn up to you know. Uh, six points per fight and obviously the most you could earn is 12 points um, in the regular and the season you, and, the, the, and the least you could earn is three points in the regular season right um, and then those points allows uh, put you into the playoffs and then because then from your points it will sit you in the playoffs um, whether you be fighting and blocked you know uh, so whatever so the way uh, that works is so number one seed will fight number eight seed and um, and so on. So number two seed will fight, you know, um, number seven and so on. The, the main prize is a million dollars, am I correct? Like if you win the tournament? That's correct. How, right, much that's do the, correct. how much do you get paid for your regular season fight? Or is that... Well, every contract, contract is, yeah, ah, every contract okay, okay, is okay. different. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But the um, main prize is a million dollars. Their fight is that... Correct. That's right. Um, but, um, you know, there are fighters that, uh, that will come in, um, and they could start at 
15 and 15 or 20 and 20 or some fighters. So, you know, yeah, yeah, everybody makes different. different different money. But if you, win the, if you win the thing, it's a million dollars, which is good money for anyone, that's, I suppose. That's correct. Yes, that's right. All right. Um, just, Ray, what, what are some of the your favorite fights that you've either been in or that you've seen or anything like that, like your, your fondest memories of the fight game? <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the amazing thing is that, and I'm so thankful for it, is that I'm still going through that journey of, you know, watching fights, studying fights, uh, looking for the best fighters that are available to join PFL. Um, but one of my one of my favorite fights um, would have to be Jahid and um, some Beaties in okay, the yeah, K1 yeah. Max show. Yeah, yes, I've seen that. And that fight, you know, and Mike Chavello and I, uh, who you know, Mike is a brother. Um, oh, sorry, right, right. Before I forget. Go ahead. I I've also messaged uh, Chevello to be on the on our podcast. Do you reckon you can put in a word for oh, us? Oh, nice! If you could put yeah, in a yeah, word, no, absolutely. No, thank yep. you. Sorry, sorry I'll, to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. I I was sending him a text. Um, but Mike and I commentated most of the uh, K1 Max shows, and I gotta say that Jahid and Sabidi Sambidi's fight, uh, it's gotta be one of the best kickboxing fights I've seen. Um. Uh, I mean, listen. There was there's so many great fights, but that those two guys uh, was are truly amazing. Some Beatties drops him in the first round, I think. He comes back. He comes back out in the second and drops some Beatties in early in the first round, second round, and then towards the end, I think some Beatties drops him again. Like it was just a back and forth fight. Um, it was just such an amazing fight. Uh, by the end of the third round, and I think I said in the commentary, I'm like, well, that's kind of crazy because I thought some BDs won that fight, but they made it a draw. And I think the judges wanted to see another round <laughs> because it was such an amazing fight. Um, in the end, uh, some BDs won the fight. And, and I believe there was a rematch where I think some BDs actually stopped Jahid in the second round, I believe. Uh, I could be mistaken, but I know for a fact that that fight was st- the rematch was stopped. Um, it was either the first or the second round. But anyhow, so that's one of my favorite fights. But man, there's so many great fights. There's so many great fights uh, in in mixed martial arts and boxing. Um, you know, one of my favorite boxing matches is Vander Holyfield versus um, uh, Riddick Bowe. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah, I remember that fight, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that fight, that was such an incredible fight. Also, uh, all the three fights, once he won, and then once he, and you know, the ones that he lost, and and that's the thing about Evander Holyfield. You know, you're never gonna see a boring fight from that guy. No. Um, so many great fights with Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Roberto Duran. I had the uh, I had the, the honor to meet Roberto Duran when he came out uh, when I was coaching Vito Balfour. Um, so he came out for a couple of days and we were able to, you know, uh, share some stories and, uh, tell us a few things about, um, but yeah, no, he's such a great guy too, you know, um, uh, still an amazing personality as well, (laughs) but there's so many great fights, whether it be boxing, kickboxing, MMA, um, um, you know, there's not one, I'm a, I'm fighting to me. It's like watching a movie, you know, there's a lot of great movies and yeah, a lot of different um, genres like five. Five. yeah a lot of different right, genres right. yeah all right um I, I you know i i gotta put in a word for the for the women because i i in the beginning of of amanda nunez um i was like okay you know she's a good fighter but it, it wasn't until she stopped holly holmes that i was like it was then i became a fan of this girl because i just watched this girl continue to improve and um, continue to win, and the, and the the way she was winning, I thought she yeah. So I think she's gonna go down in history right now as probably the greatest female fighter. She's ever. scary. She, she's a know. scary human being, man. Yeah, she she she's amazing. Like it's just um, yeah. But i you know um, I'd always supported female fighting and whatnot, but 
that, you know, uh, Amanda, I thought, just continued to show different uh, ways of winning, whether she was knocking out with her hands or she was knocking you out or she was submitting you or she was knocking you, knocking you out with a head kick. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, that, that, you know, that made me a fan. All right. Ray, thank you so much, man, for coming on. We appreciate it so much. Appreciate your time. Um, do you have any any uh, where can people find you? Uh, do you have any projects coming up that you want to let, let people know about? Yeah, I'm mainly on um, on Instagram, uh, Sugar, uh, Sugar Ray Seffel, um, at Sugar Ray Seffel, should I say? Um, I'm trying to uh, get back into my Twitter, but I'm not a big Twitter anymore these days. Uh, Instagram is kind of like pretty much, and Facebook is the same. Uh, my fan page is Sugar Ray Seffel. Um, but yeah, you know, the PFL is still in the works, and um, uh, we're looking to put out some content. Uh, you know, this coming weeks. Uh, but in terms of the season, it's been postponed to 2021. Um, and, I, you know, we're talking to some some free agencies right now. And so I think it's, um, it's going to, I think the best is yet to come in 2021 for PFL. Okay. Awesome. No worries. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving up your Sunday afternoon there in Las Vegas. <laughs> And uh, we'll That's a, it's a relaxing day for me. <laughs> awesome. We'll, we'll hope to hear from you soon. Anyways, best of luck with everything. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.